Okay, so uh, welcome back after lunch. They've turned up the house lights, so apparently this is last call. Um, you know, you, you can, no, no, not really. We're not kicking you out of the bar. Um, so welcome to a talk that I was originally told was going to be 30 minutes long and now is a suddenly one hour long. So we are gonna have a conversation. Um, my name is Katie Masouris. I am the Chief Policy Officer for a company called Hacker One. I have been at this company since the beginning of June, and prior to that, I spent seven years as a security strategist at Microsoft. Before that, I spent seven years as a penetration tester uh, among some of you who are part of my at stake mafia family um, in this room. So, uh, and once upon a time, I was a Linux developer. So. A lot of those experiences for me translate into empathy um, across being a bug hunter and being among the hunted and creating response programs for open source uh, software and some of the biggest closed source software in the world. Um, last year I launched Microsoft's first ever bug bounty programs. Anybody heard of those? All right. Who's the guy who got $100,000? Is he in the room right now? Or is he still sleeping it off? I think he's sleeping it off. Okay, well, um, James Forsha, who is here at 44Con, was the very first recipient of uh, the largest single bounty um, given by a major vendor, which was 100,000 US dollars, and that was for a mitigation bypass technique uh, against the latest software. It was not for a single bug, an individual bug. It was for a technique. Um, so today, I was gonna actually talk to you guys about uh, relationship advice, which if you know me personally, this is hilarious, actually. Yeah. Okay, yes. Um, yeah, I'm divorced. That's why this is funny. Um, but it's relationship advice between the hunters and the hunted, right? So between the bug hunters, how many bug hunters in the room? Okay. How many of you feeling hunted? <laughs> okay. So. In terms of where I skew the conversation of how we're gonna spend our time today, I'm hoping that a lot of you will have questions. I might have some audience plants, you know, never know. But um, I'm hoping that you guys have a lot of questions because really, it, you know, I can talk about the subject for hours, which is probably why they felt okay about just suddenly doubling my talk time because they know I'll just keep talking. Um, but I think that what we really need to have around this is a conversation about how you can make it work for you as a bug hunter and how organizations who are thinking about doing a bug bounty might be able to structure their programs so that it is mutually beneficial. So, First and foremost, um, how many of you are at organizations that host a bug bounty program of some kind? Okay, all right, a little bit. Um, how many of you are thinking, or at organizations that are thinking about hosting a bug bounty? Okay, a lot more. So, it took my former employer about three years to, and three years of my time, to figure out how to structure a bug bounty program for them. Um, there were, bug bounty programs certainly were in, in existence for quite some time, you know, a brief history of bug bounties, what, it was Netscape, you know, back in the mid-90s, starting with $500. Um, we didn't see a whole lot of new bug bounty activity under the sun um, from vendors themselves until about 2010. There were certainly third-party vulnerability brokers out there and whatnot, but pretty much the, the way that as a pen tester or bug finder you would make money is ideally you would actually work for a consulting company and be a professional pen tester. Certainly you could always make money doing crime. Crime always you know, is an option. But most of us who have the skills to do that made a choice at a certain point and decided that actually we, we just want to do this legitimately and get, get paid for it. Um, the industry has grown and matured and changed and I think the 2010 was really the turning point. And so that was when other vendors like Google started offering bug bounties. And um, again, it was a pretty much straight up bounty program. Um, these are the bugs that are in scope, and this is how much we're willing to pay for them, and go at it. Um, when I, I created the ones for Microsoft, the, the considerations that I had to take into account was that there was a really broad product portfolio, right? Mixed hardware, software, services. Deciding what was in scope and deciding what the right targets were, oh, and over 800 supported products. So you couldn't just offer a bounty and be done with it. So 
what did I do? I used some of the empathy that I had for the business units to structure something that would work for them. So if you, any of you recall, there was a true bug bounty program running for 30 days at the beginning of the IE11 beta period, and that was, that was actually looking for individual bugs and paying for those. So the reason it was structured that way is because it was actually looking at the pattern of bugs that the company was getting anyway, right? They would get the bugs, typically a big spike of bulletin class vulnerabilities would come in after uh, the code was locked and released to manufacturing. That is kind of the worst time for an organization to get a whole bunch of critical vulnerabilities. So what was the bounty program structured to do? It was an incentive program to drive the researchers' eyes who were already going to be looking at the product, already going to be turning in some bugs, drive them to turn them in earlier. So you as bug hunters, when you're thinking about participating in somebody's bug bounty program, first rule is make sure that you read what it is that they're looking for. You know, we actually got a lot of submissions that were outside the scope and people were asking, well, can I get money for this? Well, it is a real bug, but it's not in the scope because the purpose of creating an incentive program is to actually incent researchers who will be looking at your stuff anyway, or maybe not, maybe looking at somebody else's stuff, incent them to look where you want them to look. So as a bug hunter, the way to make this work for you is to, one, read the rules, right? Don't give the unsolicited bug to a vendor who is not necessarily prepared or willing to accept it, whether they have a bug bounty program or not, right? Um, we'll see these things all uh, actually a lot um, where researchers will come in and they'll say, but, but I, you know, I, could, I can do this, I can DOS, you know, I can DOS your, your entire system. Well, if you read the rules, DOS is actually not in scope and we're not paying for it. And then the researcher gets really upset because they spent time on it. They spent time trying to look for it. And in the end, it's about managing expectations in this bi-directional relationship that you have, right? So researchers themselves, um, you're, it's, you're making a, an investment in your time and your skills, and why would you waste that on a vendor who either doesn't want to receive the bug, or uh, if you're expecting to be paid for it, um, you know, there are other options, right? So you can actually look at the vendors who have, who have proper programs and have the ability and the desire to receive your vulnerability reports. Okay, so I have a couple notes here. Well, first and foremost, I want to ask the audience, so um, does anybody have any particular questions that they wanted answered during this conversation? Does anyone have a question so far? Okay, hold on. I think there's a fundamental hurdle that companies have to jump over if they're going to start a bug bounty program. If you go break into someone's car, and then you go to them and say, hey, look, I can break into your car, give me money, they're not going to do that. Breaking into software, if you break into an Azure or a web service, that's probably illegal, at least unlawful in the same way. So how do you persuade companies that encouraging and uh, paying for illegal behavior is something that they want to be doing? OK, so there's a couple questions in there. Um, online services is a great example of a uh, legal gray area. So back in 2007, um, Microsoft was actually the first major vendor to put um, just one line up on an FAQ around online services and said, if you privately disclose vulnerabilities to us and, and give us a chance to fix it, we will not pursue legal action against you. That was hugely significant. Other companies followed suit. So first things first, a company has to actually be willing to define what those rules are for what, what they consider to be acceptable behavior. So if you look at, you know, if you go to hackerone.com slash programs, there's a list of all the programs that, that my company supports. And when you go to their individual pages, you kind of, you read their rules of engagement, right? And before you're hunting bugs for anybody, you should probably read what, read what it looks like acceptable behavior to them. So the online services bit, um, 
a company has to decide what is important to them. Usually, the common threads that I've seen in companies is they say no DOS, don't, de don't deliberately try to degrade the service that, that is live and running, and two, do your best to not have a privacy violation. So if you think about it, they may feel free to incent the research community to look for bugs in their online services, but they've made a commitment to their users to try and protect their privacy. So they can't, on the one hand, say, you know, go ahead and break privacy of our users, and we'll pay you for it. So actually, a case like that came up um, last year. How many of you remember the Facebook case where somebody posted to Zuckerberg's page, right? You guys remember this? And they didn't pay him because he violated the rules. And a lot of people got mad about that, and there was a crowdsourced funding for paying this guy because Facebook wouldn't. Um, but if you think it through, how could Facebook pay him? You know, there are, there are discretionary elements when you're running a bug bounty program where you can, you can, at your discretion, decide to pay a little more or pay outside of the scope. That was one that the vendor really couldn't break their own rules about that and still continue on you know, with their program because essentially that would be saying, yeah, it's okay to intentionally violate the privacy of our users. So the guy did get paid. I think he got crowdsourced a bounty of about 12 grand. So it worked out actually much better for him you know, in that one particular case. But um, I think your original question was, how do you convince a company to allow that kind of testing? Well, I think one of the things is there have been, you know, a lot more organizations who recognize that this is being open to security researchers telling you about vulnerabilities is not only a good thing, it actually might save you and your customers a whole lot of headache. So I think there's been a tipping point, um, you know, achieved in the last couple of years where more and more organizations are being convinced of this. How would you as a researcher convince them? Probably not directly. So let me take a step back. So uh, two things that, that I had done in my career that taught me a lot about how vendors are um, prepared to receive vulnerability reports was starting two different vulnerability research programs. I started Microsoft Vulnerability Research and I started Semantic Vulnerability Research. And those two programs were designed for our own employees who found vulnerabilities in third-party products to be able to report them safely you know, to the organization in question. You wouldn't believe how many times, even wearing the cape of a giant mega corporation, if we came to a vendor who was sort of uninitiated in the dark arts, um, how many times they accused us of trying to sell them something, uh, trying to extort them, even, we weren't asking for any money. This was, this was just giant mega corporations, vulnerability, you know, um, finding program, just reporting a bug. Um, what that taught me was that even if you are well represented and well shielded by your parent organization in reporting a vulnerability to a third party, if that third party is uninitiated in the art of vulnerability response and being gracious and accepting these gifts from you, um, they, you're gonna have a bad time and so are they. Um, so the answer to that question is as an individual, I would not waste your time trying to convince an organization that has not figured this out yet. You can, there are a number of options. There are educational options you can point them to. There are ISO standards that um, I sacrificed years of my life in helping to make um, there are, that have been published this year. So there's an ISO standard um, on vulnerability disclosure that was published in February of this year, um, ISO 29147. And there is another one on internal vulnerability handling processes, and that's ISO 30111, also published this year. You can point a vendor who doesn't know what they're doing in terms of vuln response to those two ISO standards. A lot of vendors will, will just say, okay, you know what, if there's a standard on it, I should probably read it. And this probably means this is something I should pay attention to. We didn't have these tools as researchers before this year to educate some of those vendors. So I hope that did that answer all of your questions or only one of them? All right, okay. See, this is good. More questions, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> I know that you had significant, well, I guess um, it took a while at Microsoft to develop 
the bug bounty program, primarily because you had to make a business case for it. I'm just wondering, now that you've switched over to HackerOne, how difficult is it to show a business case to third-party companies that are kind of sitting on the fence and aren't quite sure whether or not it's, it's right for them? Okay, that is a great question. So, um, you know, in if we, if we take it back to the relationship metaphor, uh, it's much better when the parties are both willing and consenting, right? <laughs> let's, let's just put it that way. Um, trying, to, trying to unlock the vendor's desire to receive vulnerability reports, it can be a subtle seduction, you know? Um, and you do, you have, to be, you, you have to be convincing, but you have to actually be prepared to listen. So coming from the hacker background, coming from the researcher background, of course, you're, you're basically thinking security purist, right? You're thinking, this is a security vulnerability, you should fix it, maybe you should pay me, but, or maybe you know, my company, if you're a pen test company, maybe my company will get work based on it. Um, this was certainly you know, before there were large uh, bug bounty programs, this was certainly how security researchers would build their reputations, right? Get credited in 10-point aerial font in a Microsoft bulletin. That was actually worth, a di that was a different kind of currency, right? That currency has been depreciated. Don't fall asleep in the back row. Stop it, I see you. <laughs> um, you're not the only ones with jet lag. Anyway, um, but uh, being willing to listen to what the business actually needs is really important. If you are inside of an organization that is on the fence and thinking about doing a bounty program, understand what is it that the business wants. So I gave an example earlier talking about the IE bounty. They were going to get those bugs anyway. They were just going to get them at a very inconvenient time. So tipping the fence, you know, or tipping the, the scale on whether or not to offer a bounty in that case was, well, you're not going to get, you're not going to be flooded out with more bugs than, than you anticipated getting. You'll still get those bugs, but timing is the thing that is of value to you in the business. So getting them earlier was one thing, you have a chance to fix them earlier, but getting them earlier also served a purpose in that it allowed you to redirect internal testing efforts during that beta period. Right? Because that is, that is the period that the company, that the business, had dedicated to fixing bugs. What better time, <laughs> what better time to align with the business needs than a time that they had already earmarked uh, fixing bugs? Okay, so, um, so yeah, the long-winded answer to your, your question is pretty much um, be prepared to listen to what the business needs. If you think of it in terms of security purism, you are going to be talking past the business owners. Um, one thing to keep in mind, and I think I've tweeted this before, it's pretty short, it's, you know, hackers gonna hack, but vendors gonna vend, right? They need to make money. So if you think about it in terms of, am I, am I aligning with what the actual business is supposed to be doing? which is building software to make money, or am I, you know, am I reporting a vulnerability in an older piece of software that's almost gonna go out of, out of support? Why, in your head, why would the business care about that kind of vulnerability versus one in a product that is new that they are trying to, to, to get customers to deploy, right? So when you're thinking through what your targets are for security research, Try and see it from the vendor's perspective. What are they going to be the most interested in? Now, switching gears this is probably a good time to switch gears to talk about some of the factors that a vendor would need to think about in terms of structuring a, a bug bounty program. So I mentioned one example, which was going for bugs in beta at the beginning of the beta period. Why would that be useful? Well, one, to kind of shift that spike. It's traffic shaping, essentially. Shift that spike to a time that's very convenient for the vendor. But the other reason is that, ideally, you have, you have tried your best to code more secure software each time. So the latest version of your software, in theory, should have all of the toasty, caramely goodness of your security development lifecycle at its best, right? Ideally, 
you will have shaken out as many bugs as you can and not even delivered them in the, in the product, even in beta. So why would, why uh, essentially what a vendor would, might be trying to do is try to learn about new vulnerability, um, vulnerability types or classes or instances that their SDL missed. So it's not just about the bug, it's about what in their security development lifecycle can be improved upon. And ideally, it's happening in real time. When I used to work at my former employer, one of the uh, ways to introduce a new security development lifecycle requirement was, you know, you describe what the requirement, the new requirement was, you describe what type of vulnerability um, it was designed to prevent, and then you would actually have to cite real cases that came in from the outside that would never have happened if you had that control in place. So. Ideally, you know, when you're structuring a bounty program, you're thinking through some of these things like, you know, do I, do I have enough confidence in my security development lifecycle that I think where I can learn the most from the security community is in the latest versions of the software? But you might try something different. You might try something like, you know what, the latest version of the software we think is pretty good. We'll offer, you know, a bounty there, but actually we also want to offer a bounty for the most deployed version of our software. So if you think about it, you know, you might be thinking, well, you know what, my customers actually don't upgrade that often or they're stuck on this one version that's three versions back because of business, other business dependencies. That means that's where my customers, most of my customers are exposed. So maybe, even though I've, I've learned better and the newest version is the most secure, maybe I want to bounty that version as well. So these are all different ways that, that a vendor might structure their bounty programs that make sense for them and translate into making sense for their customers. I want more questions. You got more questions. Ooh, oh, whoa, 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 okay. <laughs> Wait, who is first? All right, you. So you've, uh, you've talked about sort of the, the way that bug bounties can inform um, an SDLC. But what do you feel like the long run potential is for bug bounties or like the role of bug bounties in the future is? Oh, such a good question. Okay. So something I used to say a lot is you can't pen test your way to secure software. The internal code name that I had for the bounty programs at my former employer was ad hoc pen testing. Because that's what a bug bounty is. You're basically, instead of hiring a pen test firm at a certain point, you are opening it up and saying, anybody? Anybody who finds a bug? Anybody? Over here. So where do I think bug bounties fit in you know, the balanced breakfast of software security? Uh, I think it belongs um, as part of a vulnerability response plan. Because you know, even with the best security development lifecycle, humans write code. Code's going to have bugs. You're going to miss something. And um, essentially, having just the ability to receive vulnerability reports and process them, that, that's actually a pretty good win. Having a bounty program on top of that, that's a way for you to direct what you would like the researchers to look at. Another really important data point from past experience. We used to receive, former we, sorry, it's an old habit, hard to break, seven years. Anyway, um, used to receive, bugs um, for all different versions of the browser. What do you think happened during that month that Microsoft was offering money for one version? Pretty much all of the other version reports dropped to zero. What did that mean? That meant that essentially the incentive was working. The researchers were like, wait, why, okay, Finally, Microsoft is offering money for bugs. Okay, we'll go look for the bugs they're actually offering money for. Worked great. So in terms of where does it fit, part of a response program that's at the end of a, ideally a proper software security development lifecycle, a way to feed back into the lifecycle, and as another, you know, another form, an evolution of penetration testing. No, somebody else had a question over here. So, relatively simple question, but um, you must have seen a wide variety of quality in the reports of bugs from people submitting bugs. 
And obviously the amount of money you offer makes a difference to that, but is there anything else that you think makes a difference to the quality of the bug reporting from random people? So you, you make an interesting point about uh, how much money you offer and essentially quality of report, what you expect to get out of the research community. We, we went through a lot of iterations on how to describe what it was former we was looking for um, because essentially you're paying a certain premium to outsource validation. So you, if you have a full POC, that is pretty much going to be a validated bug. So the language that is used and the price that you set for something like that is gonna be higher than for example saying, oh, I'll just take your fuzzer crashes, whatever. I'll do all the investigative work myself. We had debated all of this. It's like somebody could you know, potentially flood out the program by just sending a whole bunch of crashes over. So it was carefully worded, saying that not only was first bug, first, one, first person to report the bug likely to get the bounty, but we actually gave it a little wiggle room and said quality of report will affect the time that we take to analyze it. So if somebody came in with the exact same bug, but somebody just threw over a, a crash jump, versus someone who threw over some POC, we're gonna look at the one with POC first. And wow, that even if it's timestamped differently, the one with the POC, it was already validated for us. So when you're thinking about what it's worth to you as a bug hunter, think about what is it that I might be trying to exploit? How hard is it to do the POC? Is it worth my time to do that much extra effort to get that much extra cash? You can do the cost benefit analysis as a bug hunter yourself. When you are the hunted, you can do the cost benefit analysis of how many people do I have to receive and analyze these vulnerability reports? How much do I want to structure you know, tiered payouts for additional work? It's different with web stuff, web stuff, you know, POC is pretty much the bug reporting itself is the POC, but when you talk about the, you know, more of the memory corruption issues, that becomes very important. Okay, there was another, oh, wait, there was another one here before you. Okay. Hi, Katie. Um, somewhat related to um, Irwin's um, question. So, how do you classify the payment for a type of bugs and the severity of it? So, you may have network stuff, you may have web stuff. So, you know, is this your ISO standard to sort of cover that gu this guideline? So the ISO standards do not cover paying for bugs, right? They also actually do not cover not suing the crap out of researchers. Mostly because international standards have to be compatible with international laws and keep it, trying to keep track of what all the international laws are around hacking and finding bugs and stuff would have been complicated. What the standards do say are things like um, good idea to express gratitude. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, be nice uh, and, great, and grateful. Um, but pricing, pricing is a tricky thing, right? When I was mentioning the 2010 advent of more vendors offering bug bounties, um, what did we see? We saw January, um, a doubling of the going rate for, for bugs, you know, because it had been $500 from, from Netscape and then Mozilla for a very, very long time. And suddenly it was a little over 1000 $1,337 by Google, right? So there was a price jump. And then there was another price jump in June of that year when it went up to 3,000, wait, 3,133 point seven dollars, right? So there was another price jump. Um, I think when it comes to setting the prices for, for vulnerabilities that you're looking for, think about it in terms of, am I, am I basically doing the best I can secure coding wise and I'm looking at certain vulnerabilities, vulnerability classes like cross-site scripting or whatever as yes, I want to fix them when the public finds them. Yes, I want to pay out something, but it's, it's fairly easy to find those bugs, relatively easy to find those bugs. The skills required are, are you know, 
more broadly known by a larger set of people. So you begin to get into a little bit of the, of the basic economics, supply and demand. There are many people who are capable of finding cross-site scripting bugs. So we'll see how the market plays out, but just things to keep in mind are, you know, the easier something is to find, the less expensive it's really going to, to be on any market, whether we're talking white market or others. You had a question. Cool. Um, looking at the like spectrum of researchers, right? Let's say there's 10% that are going to be black market. Black market's going to sell black. Like that's just what's going to happen. You've got 10% on the other end that white market. They're going to give their bugs away because they're goody two shoes, and that's what they're going to do, right? Um, so you've got this 80% in the middle that lean one way or the other, but they're capable of doing both. Do you think if numbers could be published for the black market to actually show how much money you would get for that, that, because like right now there's this mythical assumption like every bug is a million dollar bug, right? And we, we know that's not true, but if you could publish those, do you think it would get more people going to the white? So my interpretation of your question is if we published that those very, very large numbers that we hear reported in the media for, you know, basically selling vulnerabilities to the highest bidder, um, if it's really not that seven-figure wet dream that we've all heard about, um, will more of the on-the-fence researchers just decide it's not worth their time and trouble? Is that the interpretation? I think, uh, okay, don't raise your hands. <laughs> or you can if you want. How many of you used to pirate music? Nobody's raising their hands, no. Okay, what happened when iTunes came about? Music piracy went down because there was a very easy and convenient way for people to legally purchase music. Basically, for people to do the right thing who just wanted to do the right thing. What I think in terms of more and more of these incentive programs becoming mainstream, more and more of these bounty programs becoming mainstream, is it's essentially the iTunization of vulnerability hunting. It is making it not be this black and white choice for the researcher of saying, I can either make money or I can do the right thing. It's I can do the right thing and make a little money. It's not gonna be as much, but I think most people I think it's more, um, it's gonna be more a factor of more and more of these programs becoming the norm and it just being the easy thing to do, to do the right thing and it's not complicated, as opposed to learning about these kind of pie in the sky numbers and wondering, well, how can I get my hands on that? Yeah. Okay, so coming back to what you just said, um, don't you think that by democratizing the price for the bug um, that people report for the bugs, eventually it's gonna go down when more reports coming in. So what do you mean by democratizing? Democratizing meaning that, for example, the more bug bounties there are, right, um, probably the price for bugs may actually come down, you know? So supply and demand, it, it might be. However, um, it, it's still, it's still not going to be the most cost-effective way for an organization to address or to find as many vulnerabilities as possible. What it really should be is organizations should be striving to make their bugs, instances of their bugs, rarer and rarer. So ideally, if this is working the way that it should towards, towards more secure software, the vendors who are offering it are not doing it as a lazy skip a few internal testing steps and just outsource it. Ideally, and that would, that would be huge numbers of bugs, easy to find, prices go down, right? Instead, ideally, they should be getting better and better, and those bugs should be rarer and rarer, and it might keep the prices relatively steady. We could go on and on about the economics here, but we are running out of time. One more question from you, and then I gotta take some other questions. Okay. So I'm interested in how you sold this to Microsoft. Obviously, you've had experience in this before, and you've built a, a phenomenal business case. <laughs> but you're talking to a bunch of suits who are interested in business and are probably not technical. What no, they were. They were, okay. So what challenges did you have back from them, and how did you solve them? Oh, I, 
had to sit down for that one. Oh my gosh. So three years of my life. Um, <laughs> three years of my life. Um, I think. I think the biggest thing that I had to do to make that work was take about five steps back from my original idea of how I would convince them. So I thought, I thought that it was a data-driven decision that I just show some data and I just do this, you know, some charts and some graphs and they will see the data and they will say yes. The mathematics makes sense on this. Yes, we shall do this. But in fact, um, getting folks who had always said no and publicly said no to suddenly say yes, well, it was a matter of taking a step back and helping those business owners understand why this would be advantageous to them and their goals, which meant I had to listen to what their goals were. I would never have even looked at when the bugs were typically coming in for that product because when I originally started it was, okay, we should buy the bugs and here's how we can structure the programs and here's the kind of things, here are some of the, you know, attack, uh, basically some of the threat modeling of a bug bounty program that I'm going to do and everything. Uh, we, we don't want to get flooded with crashes so we'll set criteria here and da 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 da, all of that stuff. I was, I was being very literal. Whereas I had to actually take so many steps back to understand what's in it for them. They had been getting bugs for free for so long. So one of the factors was actually looking at the reporting trends of direct reporting to the vendor versus going through a white market broker like ZDI or iDefense. And uh, the first year's data that I showed, I was a strategist, so it was my job to tell the, you know, basically be Cassandra, doomed to know the future, and no one believes her, right? Um, <laughs> scratching my own eyes out. But uh, the, the, the data that I showed showed that over 90% of vulnerabilities were being reported directly to Microsoft for free. But I was postulating that actually this trend is going to change and more and more of the vuln reports are gonna go through the brokers. Why? Because people don't wanna to have to make a choice between doing the right thing and getting paid. So I predicted this and they said, well, come back to us when it's happening. <laughs> we don't believe you. <laughs> so that's why it took two more years. I needed two more years of data. Long answer to that question, but hopefully that answered your question in that particular case. Above, above all, don't take it for granted that everybody is on that same mental journey that you are in terms of your logic and your graphs and your charts and your numbers. They need something that translates to what they actually want. I had done uh, an improvisational speaking class and they had us running around the room tracking each other and you're not supposed to tell the person that you're tracking that you're tracking them and you have to keep this other person between you or you keep yourself between this other person. What that was actually trying to teach us is that everybody has their own goals as we're milling around like molecules bouncing off of each other in a boiling pot, right? That's exactly what you're doing when you're trying to negotiate some of these uh, strategy shifts in an organization. Okay, how much time do I have? Okay, I have no idea how much time I have. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi, um, I really understand the uh, bring your own bag hunter business model. Um, however, in the future, if it, is, if it does work, well, it's great, but how will be smaller vendors be able to compete with Google or Microsoft in this case, with the money they're offering? to um, hunt bugs on their products. I mean, it will be difficult for them to catch up, I mean, to offer like $100,000 for a month for them to um, look for bugs or whatever. It will be very difficult, I think. So, I think if I'm to distill your question, um, it's you're asking how do smaller vendors compete for researcher eyes if they can't afford the bigger bounties? Is that right? Okay. Um, Again, I think bug bounties are, you know, they're an evolutionary form of penetration testing. So I think an organization that has a smaller budget to spend on activities like penetration testing needs to look at 
where their security investments make the most sense. If an organization is having trouble coming up with bug bounty money, they probably should actually take whatever money they were about to put into a bounty program and invest in better tools, training, threat modeling for their developers because that's going to actually pay off for them more. So if they're actually if money is an object, invest in the proactive security part first. That doesn't exactly answer your question, but it is my honest advice. Um, I would say that, you know, the researchers have a choice about what they're going to look at. Sometimes it's not about the money per se. Sometimes it's about the attractiveness of the target, the recognition that you can get, the exposure. Yes, right, right. You know, so the recognition is um, it is a currency, right? It is a form of currency. Another question. I know you're out there. I planted f a few of you. Come on, wait. What? What? Oh. Can you uh, imagine a future where bug bounties might be on a national scale, looking at components for infrastructure, for example, rather than at a corporate scale? Um, as in, imagine a country, some random country, Albonia, offering a bug bounty for, you know, uh, components used in its transport system or something like that. Okay, so what you're really asking about is uh, some sort of central bug buying for an industry as opposed to vendors themselves offering their own. Huh? Or an infrastructure, right. <sighs> Remember how I said an organization needs to be prepared, prepared to receive vulnerability reports before this is going to work? <laughs> it's not going to work. You know what? You can buy all the bugs you want. If they have no way, if they don't have the resources to invest in investigation, triage, remediation decisions, you know, actually creating a fix, and if they have no means to distribute that fix, critical infrastructure. <clears throat> You can buy all the bugs you want. It's not going to help, right? So do I, do I envision this world in which that, that makes sense? I envision a world in which people will try it. I don't think it's going to work out. To sort of um, lead on from that, and this diverts like very kind of far off, off the beaten path, but um, do you think that in the future there will be legal frameworks that will require that sort of thing or that that's like something that we could try and realize for sort of the betterment of critical infrastructure? So a legal framework Oh, uh, okay. So, so an ISO standard type of thing with requirements, or like you said, a PCI type of thing with fines if you don't do it. Um, do I envision a future in which this this may occur? <sighs> Again, I think we've seen where PCI has not really done what it promised to do, right? Is it better than nothing? Probably. Um, perfect is the enemy of the good, is what an old boss of mine used to say. Dave, shout outs to Dave. Um, perfect is the enemy of the good. Um, do I think that imperfect, you know, sort of regulatory thing is, is how, um, how this is going to shake out? I think the ISO standards themselves, the way that ISO standards actually have teeth, just FYI, is Usually, they're, they're voluntary for an organization to say, yes, I comply with this ISO standard. Voluntary to the extent that if they're a global business that needs to do business with, let's say, governments or other very large buyers with very large purchasing power, they will have a set of requirements. So I can see the existing ISO standards being leveraged in that way, where they become part of the necessary purchasing requirements of very, very large buyers. With that, I don't actually see a need to necessarily make additional ones or make it you know, legally required or whatnot or impose fines. It's the fine will be if you don't comply with the standard, well, then we're not going to buy from you. 
So I would love to see you know, kind of commercial pressure come up to at least say organizations need to have a means to accept vulnerability reports from the outside, even if they don't offer a bounty. Just accept vulnerability reports from an external party, whether it's a individual hacker, a vendor who, you know, has some hackers on staff, and actually I need to bookmark talking about companies that employ people who are capable of finding vulnerabilities and those people taking part in other people's bug bounty programs. Remind me to talk about that in a second. But I think, you know, at the very least, um, what we have now in terms of those ISO standards as tools to drive this, this behavior, I think um, driving the awareness to organizations who have very large purchasing power, like governments and whatnot, if you have government friends, you should talk to them about asking their vendors, do you have, do you comply with ISO 20, 29147? Do you comply with ISO 30111? Do you even know what those are? You know, that kind of thing. That will help. Another question before I talk about internal uh, policies on bug hunters. Um, I suspect that um, some thoughts that cross the minds of senior management is something like, um, yeah, we know we're not perfect with security, and we are concerned that maybe if we offer a bug bounty program, some of the hackers will come test, find something, and probably they will decide to exploit it and win some money illegally then uh, compared to disclosing it. What do you think about it? Yeah, so uh, anybody who is going to go after your stuff to exploit it, they're doing it already. They're already doing it. So even without a bug bounty program, any organization who just says, look, Anybody who finds something, we do want to hear about it. That's, that's a good thing. Um, so yeah, if you offer a bounty program, it's not going to change the behavior of criminals. The, to Josh's point earlier, there are, there are people who are always going to, you know, kind of go the mercenary route, try to sell to the highest bidder, et cetera. Um, not going not gonna to win those guys over, guys and gals. OK. Um, we have time for. Maybe one more question, or should I should I talk to you a little bit about internal policy for the hackers that work for you? Would that be helpful? All right. Okay, so 2010, bounty programs were growing in the world, as I said. Uh, had a lot of people inside the company that were capable of finding vulnerabilities in third-party products. Should we or shouldn't we let them participate in other people's bounty programs. Essentially, should we let them sell bugs? Hmm. Interesting question. So I drafted something that was became you know, a, an actual corporate policy at my former employer um, that said, if you find a vulnerability in a third party product and you feel like disclosing it, we have MSVR, which was Microsoft Vulnerability Research, Come check by us so we can make sure that first party products, you know, are not also affected. It would be kind of bad form if you OD'd us because out of somebody else's advisory and some other product, right? So we'd do that quick check. We'd coordinate if it was a multi-vendor issue, if it was actually affected us and others, you know, et cetera. We'd, we'd coordinate it for you so you as the researcher could just get back to your job, do whatever you want. Coordination pain part would just be up to us. But then there was a clause in there that said, if you find the vulnerability on your own time using your own equipment, using no proprietary tools, technology, or knowledge, then you may participate in a certain set of approved bounty programs. And they did have to check with us, right? Because there's a certain set of approved ones. Basically, we weren't saying, go ahead and sell to the highest bidder. <laughs> No, right? But what we were saying was, yes, it is possible for you to participate in Pwn to Own and keep the money. It is possible for you to report a vulnerability in a third party product if you followed these rules and get money from ZDI. It was possible for you to collect the bounty from Google, right? 
Why did we do this? Why did they let me do this? <laughs> I asked my question, um, that question of myself all the time. I just kept going. Um, because if you think about it, how many of you are parents? How many of you plan to be parents? How many of you have been born, right? Yes, all of you, yes. So what, you know, how did it work if your parents said you're not allowed to do X under any circumstances ever? With me, it was, you're not allowed to date. That explains a lot of things, <laughs> right? Uh, they'll sneak out behind your back, right? So what did, this, what did this, this set of acceptable behaviors that was codified in a corporate policy do? It allowed something that was surprising, right? But it actually surprised a lot of the researchers. A lot of them just donated their, their bounties to charity because they qualified for a bounty with Google or something like that. They said, oh, donated to charity because I know I can't keep it. Actually, you, you totally could have kept that. Oh, really? Yeah. So, but it allowed visibility into what we knew was already possible and already potentially happening. The other thing it allowed was us to retain top talent if they wanted to look at bugs and make a little cash on the side or get recognized and whatnot, that's all fine. Just let us know so that, one, you don't cause our customers pain by accidentally ODing our customers if it's a multi-vendor issue, you know? And the fact of the matter was, um, MSVR started publishing advisories for certain serious issues that employees of the company had found, gotten over to the vendors, and fixed. So this was all just part of essentially service to our own customers, if you think about it in terms of the broader ecosystem of the platform. Very happy, everybody's happy. Okay, do we have time for one more question or is it done? I have five minutes? That's time for one more question. All right, who wants to be the last question? Mm -hmm. Oh, 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 okay. So I'd like to ask, uh, what do you think of uh, Google Project Zero, and if uh, you think other companies will follow? Um, Google Project Zero. So that is where they are looking for vulnerabilities in a lot of third-party software, right? Two vulnerability research programs that I've founded in my career, semantic vulnerability research, Microsoft vulnerability research. These were designed to find, allow the employees of the company I worked for to find vulnerabilities in third-party products, to make the internet a safer place. So what do I think about Project Zero? I think it's awesome. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm happy that, um, I'm happy that smart people are working on trying to drain the swamp. It's swampy out there. Okay, so I'm gonna actually be around. <laughs> are there any other, uh, one last question, maybe a short one? Quick one? I do talk a lot. You see, they knew I could talk for an entire hour about this. I could keep talking, okay, one more. So after HackerOne takes over the world, what's next for you? Oh my gosh, uh, Disneyland? I don't know, I've got, I've got a couple kids. Um, no, I don't, you know, I'm really, I, I tend to stay at companies for a very long time, so I can't, I can't even imagine what's after this. But um, anyway, if you want to come find me after this, I will be around, um, not leaving this country for another few days, so, um, and hopefully, eventually, the jet lag will wear off. But um, if you have other questions, definitely don't hesitate to come ask. And thank you very much for your time and attention and your questions. Thanks.